Section 13 of The Extermination of the American Bison. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Extermination of the American Bison by William T. Hornaday the present value of the bison to cattle growers the bison in captivity and domestication almost from time immemorial it has been known that the american bison takes kindly to captivity herds contentedly with domestic cattle and crosses with them with the utmost readiness it was formerly believed and indeed the tradition prevails even now to quite an extent that on account of the hump on the shoulders a domestic cow could not give birth to a half-breed calf this belief is entirely without foundation and is due to theories rather than facts numerous experiments in buffalo breeding have been made and the subject is far from being a new one as early as 1701, the Huguenot settlers at Manikin Town on the James River, a few miles above Richmond, began to domesticate buffaloes. It is also a matter of historical record that in 1786, or thereabouts, buffaloes were domesticated and bred in captivity in Virginia. And Albert Gallatin states that in some of the northwestern counties the mixed breed was quite common. In 1815, a series of elaborate and valuable experiments in cross-breeding the buffalo and domestic cattle was begun by Mr. Robert Wycliffe of Lexington, Kentucky, and continued by him for upwards of 30 years. Quite recently, the buffalo breeding operations of Mr. S. L. Bedson of Stony Mountain, Manitoba, and Mr. C. J. Jones, of Garden City, Kansas, have attracted much attention, particularly for the reason that the efforts of both these gentlemen have been directed toward the practical improvement of the present breeds of range cattle. For this reason, the importance of the work in which they are engaged can hardly be overestimated and the results already obtained by Mr. Bedson, whose experiments antedate those of Mr. Jones by several years, are of the greatest interest to Western cattle growers. Indeed, unless the stock of purebred buffaloes now remaining proves insufficient for the purpose, I fully believe that we will gradually see a great change wrought in the character of Western cattle by the introduction of a strain of buffalo blood. The experiments which have been made thus far prove conclusively that 1. The male bison crosses readily with the opposite sex of domestic cattle, but a buffalo cow has never been known to produce a half-breed calf. 2. The domestic cow produces a half-breed calf successfully. 3. The progeny of the two species is fertile to any extent, yielding half-breeds, quarter, three-quarter breeds, and so on. 4. The bison breeds in captivity with perfect regularity and success. Need of an Improvement in Range Cattle Ever since the earliest days of cattle ranching in the West, stockmen have had it in their power to produce a breed which would equal in beef-bearing qualities the best breeds to be found upon the plains and be so much better calculated to survive the hardships of winter that their annual losses would have been very greatly reduced whenever there is an unusually severe winter such as comes about three times in every decade if not even oftener range cattle perish by thousands it is an absolute impossibility 
for every ranchman who owns several thousand or even several hundred head of cattle to provide hay for them, even during the severest portion of the winter season, and consequently that cattle must depend wholly upon their own resources. When the winter is reasonably mild, and the snows never very deep, nor lying too long at the time on the ground, the cattle live through the winter with very satisfactory success. Thanks to the wind, it usually happens that the falling snow is blown off the ridges as fast as it falls, leaving the grass sufficiently uncovered for the cattle to feed upon it. If the snowfall is universal, but not more than a few inches in depth, the cattle paw through it here and there, and eke out a subsistence, on quarter rations it may be, until a friendly Chinook wind sets in from the southwest, and dissolves the snow as if by magic in a few hours' time. But when a deep snow comes, and lies on the ground persistently, week in and week out, when the warmth of the sun softens and moistens its surface sufficiently for a returning cold wave to freeze it into a hard crust, forming a universal wall of ice between the luckless steer and his only food. The cattle starve and freeze in immense numbers. Being totally unfitted by nature to survive such unnatural conditions, it is not strange that they succumb. Under present conditions, the stockman simply stakes his cattle against the winter elements and takes his chances on the results, which are governed by circumstances wholly beyond his control. The losses of the fearful winter of 1886 to 1887 will probably never be forgotten by the cattlemen of the great western grazing ground. In many portions of Montana and Wyoming, the cattlemen admitted a loss of 50% of their cattle, and in some localities the loss was still greater. The same conditions are liable to prevail next winter or any succeeding winter, and we may yet see more than half the range cattle in the West perish in a single month. Yet all this time the cattlemen have had it in their power, by the easiest and simplest method in the world, to introduce a strain of hardy native blood in their stock, which would have made it capable of successfully resisting a much greater degree of hunger and cold. It is really surprising that the desirability of crossbreeding the buffalo and domestic cattle should for so long a time have been either overlooked or disregarded. While cattle growers generally have shown the greatest enterprise in producing special breeds for milk, for butter, or for beef, cattle with short horns and cattle with no horns at all, only two or three men have had the enterprise to try to produce a breed particularly hardy and capable. A buffalo can weather storms and outlive hunger and cold, which would kill any domestic steer that ever lived. When nature placed him on the treeless and blizzard-swept plains, she left him well equipped to survive whatever natural conditions he would have to encounter. The most striking feature of his entire tout ensemble is his magnificent suit of hair and fur combined, the warmest covering possessed by any quadruped save the musk ox. The head, neck, and forequarters are clothed with hide and hair so thick as to be almost, if not entirely, impervious to cold. The hair on the body and hindquarters is long, fine, very thick, and of that peculiar woolly quality which constitutes the best possible protection against cold. Let him who doubts the warmth of a good buffalo robe try to weather a blizzard with something else, and then try the robe. The very form of the buffalo, short, thick legs, and head hung very near the ground suggests most forcibly 
a special fitness to wrestle with Mother Earth for a living, snow or no snow. A buffalo will flounder for days through deep snowdrifts without a morsel of food, and survive where the best range steer would literally freeze on foot, bolt upright, as hundreds did in the winter of 1886 to 87. While range cattle turn tail to a blizzard and drift helplessly, the buffalo faces it every time, and remains master of the situation. It has for years been a surprise to me that western stockmen have not seized upon the opportunity presented by the presence of the buffalo to improve the character of their cattle. Now that there are no longer any buffalo calves to be had on the plains, for the trouble of catching them, and the few domesticated buffaloes that remain are worth fabulous prices, we may expect to see a great deal of interest manifested in this subject, and some costly efforts made to atone for previous lack of forethought. The Character of the Buffalo Domestic Hybrid The subjoined illustration from a photograph kindly furnished by Mr. C. J. Jones represents a ten-months-old half-breed calf, male, the product of a buffalo bull and domestic cow. The prepotency of the sire is apparent at the first glance, and to so marked an extent that the illustration would pass muster anywhere as having been drawn from a full-blood buffalo. The head, neck, and hump, and the long woolly hair that covers them, proclaim the buffalo in every line, excepting that the hair on the shoulders, below the hump, is of the same length as that on the body and hind quarters, there is, so far as one can judge from an excellent photograph, no difference whatever observable between this lusty young half-breed and a full-blood buffalo calf of the same age and sex. Mr. Jones describes the color of this animal as iron gray, and remarks, You will see how even the fur is, being as long on the hind parts as on the shoulders and neck, very much unlike the buffalo, which is so shaggy about the shoulders and so thin farther back. Upon this point it is to be remarked that the hair on the body of a yearling or two-year-old buffalo is always very much longer in proportion to the hair on the forward parts than it is later in life, and when the shoulder hair is always decidedly longer than the back of it. During the first two years, the contrast is by no means so very great. A reference to the memoranda of hair measurements already given will afford precise data on this point. In regard to half-breed calves, Mr. Bedson states in a private letter that the hump does not appear until several months after birth. Altogether, the male calf described above so strongly resembles a pure-blood buffalo as to be generally mistaken for one. The form of the adult half-blood cow promptly proclaims her origin. The accompanying plate, also from a photograph supplied by Mr. Jones, accurately represents a half-breed cow, six years old, weighing about 1,800 pounds. Her body is very noticeably larger in proportion than that of the cow buffalo, her pelvis much heavier, broader, and more cow-like, therein being a decided improvement upon the small and weak hindquarters of the wild species. The hump is quite noticeable, but not nearly so high as the pure buffalo cow. The hair on the forequarters, neck and head, is decidedly shorter, especially on the head, the frontlet and chin beard being conspicuously lacking. The tufts of long, coarse black hair which clothe the forearm of the buffalo cow are almost absent, but apparently 
the hair on the body and hindquarters has lost but little, if any, of its length, density, and fine, furry quality. The horns are decidedly cow-like in their size, length, and curvature. Regarding the general character of the half-breed buffalo and his herd in general, Mr. Bedson writes me as follows, in a letter dated September 12th, 1888. The nucleus of my herd consisted of a young buffalo bull and four heifer calves, which I purchased in 1877, and the increase from these few has been most rapid, as will be shown by a tabular statement farther on. Success with the breeding of the pure buffalo was followed by experiments in crossing with the domestic animal. This crossing has generally been between a buffalo bull and an ordinary cow, and with the most encouraging results, since it had been contended by many that although the cow might be the calf from the buffalo, yet it would be at the expense of her life, owing to the hump on a buffalo shoulder. But this hump does not appear until several months after birth. This has been proved a fallacy respecting this herd at least, for calving has been attended with no greater percentage of losses than would be experienced in ranching with the ordinary cattle. Buffalo cows and crosses have dropped calves at as low a temperature as 20 degrees below zero, and the calves were sturdy and healthy. The half-breed resulting from the cross, as above mentioned, has been again crossed with a thoroughbred buffalo bull, producing a three-quarter breed animal, closely resembling the buffalo, the head and robe being quite equal, if not superior. The half-breeds are very prolific. The cow drops a calf annually. They are also very hardy indeed as they take the instinct of the buffalo during the blizzards and storms, and do not drift like native cattle. They remain upon the open prairie during our severest winters, while the thermometer ranges from 30 to 40 degrees below zero, with little or no food except what they wrestled on the prairie, and no shelter at all. In nearly all the ranching parts of North America, fathering and housing of cattle is imperative in a more or less degree, creating an item of expense felt by all interested in cattle raising. But the buffalo, half-breed, retains all its native hardihood, needs no housing, forages in the deepest snows for its own food, yet becomes easily domesticated, and consequently needs but little herding, Therefore, the progeny of the buffalo is easily reared, cheaply fed, and requires no housing in winter. Three very essential points in stock raising. They are always in good order, and I consider the meat of the half-breed much preferable to domestic animals, while the robe is very fine indeed, the fur being evened up on the hind parts, the same as on the shoulders. During the history of the herd, accident and other causes have compelled the slaughtering of one or two, and in these instances the carcasses have sold for eighteen cents per pound, the hides in their dressed state for fifty dollars to seventy-five dollars each. A half-breed buffalo ox, four years old, crossed with a buffalo bull and Durham cow, was killed last winter and weighed 1,280 pounds dressed beef. One pure buffalo bull, now in my herd, weighs fully 2,000 pounds, and a half-breed bull, 1,700 to 1,800 pounds. The three-quarter breed is an enormous animal in size, and has an extra good robe, which will readily bring $40 to $50 in any market where there is a demand for robes. They are also very prolific, and I consider them 
the common cattle for our range cattle for the northern climate, while the half and quarter breeds will be the animals for the more southern district. The half and three quarter breed cows, when really matured, will weigh from 1,400 to 1,800 pounds. I have never crossed them except with the common grade of cows, while I believe a cross with the Galloways would produce the handsomest robe ever handled and make the best range cattle in the world. I have not had time to give my attention to my herd, more than to let them range on the prairies at will. By proper care, great results can be accomplished. Honorary C. J. Jones of Garden City, Kansas, whose years of experience with the buffaloes both as old-time hunter, catcher, and breeder, has earned for him the sobriquet of Buffalo Jones, which five years ago became deeply interested in the question of improving range cattle by crossing with the buffalo. With characteristic western energy, he has pursued the subject from that time until the present. Having made five trips to the range of the only buffaloes remaining, from the great southern herd, and captured sixty-eight buffalo calves and eleven adult cows with which to start a herd. In a short article published in the Farmer's Review, Chicago, August twenty-second, 1888, Mr. Jones gives his views on the value of the buffalo in crossbreeding as follows. In all my meanderings, I have not found a place, but I could count more carcasses of cattle than living animals. Who has not ridden over some of the western railways and counted dead cattle by the thousands? The great question is, where can we get a race of cattle that will stand blizzards and endure the drifting snow, and will not be driven with the storms against the railroad fences and pasture fences? there to perish for the want of nerve to face the northern winds for a few miles, to where the winter grasses could be had in abundance. Realizing these facts, both from observation and pocket, we pulled on our thinking cap, and these points came vividly to our mind. 1. We want an animal that is hardy. 2. We want an animal with nerve and endurance. 3. We want an animal that faces the blizzards and endures the storms. 4. We want an animal that will rustle the prairies and not yield to discouragement. 5. We want an animal that will fill the above bill and make good beef and plenty of it. All the points above could easily be found in the buffalo, except the fifth, and even that is more than filled as to the quality, but not in quantity. Where is the old-timer who has not had a cut from the hump or sirloin of a fat buffalo cow in the fall of the year? And where is the one who will not make affidavit that it was the best meat he ever ate? Yes, the fat was very rich equal to the marrow from the bone of domestic cattle. The great question remained unsolved as to the quantity of meat from the buffalo. I finally heard of a half-breed buffalo in Colorado, and immediately set out to find it. I traveled at least 1,000 miles to find it, and found a five-year-old half-breed cow that had been bred to domestic bulls, and had brought forth two calves a yearling, and a sucking calf that gave promise of great results. The cow had never been fed, but depended altogether on the range, and when I saw her, in the fall of 1883, I estimated her weight at 1,800 pounds. She was a brindle, and had a handsome robe even in September. She had as good hindquarters as ordinary cattle. Her foreparts were heavy, and resembled the buffalo, yet not near so much of the hump. 
the offspring showed but very little of the buffalo, yet they possessed a woolly coat, which showed clearly that they were more than domestic cattle. What we can rely on by having one-fourth, one-half, and three-fourths breeds might be analyzed as follows. We can depend upon a race of cattle unequaled in the world for hardiness and durability, a good meat-bearing animal, the best and only fur-bearing animal of the bovine race, the animal always found in a storm where it is overtaken by it, a race of cattle so clannish as never to separate and go astray, the animal that can always have free range, as they exist where no other animal can live, the animal that can water every third day and keep fat, ranging from twenty to thirty miles from water. In fact, they are the perfect animal for the plains of North America. One-fourth breeds for Texas, one-half breeds for Colorado and Kansas, and three-fourths breeds for more northern country, is what will soon be sought after more than any living animal then we will never be confronted with dead carcasses from starvation, exhaustion, and lack of nerve, as in years gone by. End of section 13